Mika? Uh, sorry, I'm not as cute as Mika, but um, I'm going to give this mic another try as well. Um, if you've been following the news this week, uh, you might have heard about the results of the Powerball jackpot, the $200 million Powerball jackpot. Uh, I think two people won first division, so they got $100 million each. Um, imagine, and I'm sure maybe many of you did imagine last week, imagine you won the first division prize for the $200, uh, $200 million lottery. Um, and um, let's imagine you won, but imagine also at the same time you didn't know you won. Let's say you bought the, the cheapest ticket, uh, you bought it, and you, you forgot about it because you thought, you know, I'll buy it just in case, but there's, there's no chance I'm going to get it. I'll just buy one anyway, and the numbers are drawn, uh, the winners are announced. You, you win first prize, and, um, but you, you just don't bother to check your numbers. Im imagine you never bother to check whether there was a, is a check with your name written on it. Imagine, imagine all you needed to do was pick up the phone, uh, and, and ask for what was yours, and you'd be rich. Counting your coins, pinching your pennies, breaking your back. If only you knew what you really had. Now, well, we know from the first half of Ephesians chapter 1 that there's a, there are a lot of things that are ours in Jesus. Paul says God has blessed us with every spiritual, with all the spiritual blessings from the heavenly realms in Jesus. In Jesus, God chose us to be his holy and blameless children. In Jesus, God adopted us as his sons. In Jesus, God redeemed us through his blood. In Jesus, God made known to us the ultimate mystery, God's cosmic plans for all things in the world to be brought under Christ. And in Jesus, we've been included in these cosmic plans and, and, and we've been sealed and guaranteed our place in it by God's Spirit. And Paul says it was God's pleasure to do all this in His love and glory and grace. And he praises God. In, in the second half of the chapter, Paul starts praying. And essentially Paul is praying that God would actually, not, not only has God already given us all of these spiritual blessings, Paul is going to pray for God to give even more. Now, before we get into what exactly it is Paul prays for, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that the way Paul prays here has a lot to teach us. You see, I mean, uh, some Christians are always praying for new blessings. God, I need a new revelation. I need new ideas. I need, I need new direction and a new sign. And, and, and we can forget that God has already blessed us. In Christ, with every spiritual blessing, God has already spoken to us through Christ in His Word. But on the other hand, some Christians can be so confident that they know everything that they need to know already, uh, that they have what they need to have already, so they lose their appetite for wanting to experience and appreciate Jesus more and more. But what does Paul do? Paul does both. Paul praises God, saying, you've given us everything already, but he also prays that we would discover more and more. So the question really posed to us by this passage is, how much do we know of what it is uh, to live in the fullness of Christ, and how much do we really want to know more? Okay, I'm going to pray as we come to his word. Lord, um, we're going into Ephesians chapter 1, and we're starting this book of Ephesians. We started last week, and, and as we think about these big questions, um, the big blessings, the big uh, ideas of what it is to be in Christ, um, help, us, help us to really uh, be wowed by it and awed by it. And whatever Paul prays here, would that become our prayer as well? Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So first things first, Paul begins by thanking God 
again. He thanks God for what he has heard about the Ephesian church. He thanks God uh, for the faith and love of these Christians in Ephesus. Faith in Jesus and love for God's people are two basic char- characteristics of all Christians. So, uh, uh, so this is what it says, verse 15 and 16. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And I've sort of bolded those verses there. Now, I want us to notice what Paul is doing. Paul is praying that God gives us something, but before he asks God for more, how does Paul begin? He begins with thanks. See, the Ephesian church has a lot to be commended for. The church in Ephesus, as we said last week, the context of the church of Ephesus is that Ephesus is a city. It's a melting pot of cultures and spiritualities and, and religions and, and probably within the church, uh, you, you also have a range of financial and social backgrounds as well. You have Jew, Gentile, you have rich, poor, you have ex-witches and sorcerers, you have ex-Artemis worshippers, ex-temple worshippers. And all of these people are sitting in church, united in Christ, with faith and love for each other. So we might think, wow hey, this Ephesian church must have had a really great discipleship program. Or or this church must have had a really great outreach and integration and connect program. Maybe they had a really great welcoming team and great hospitality and morning tea program. And maybe they did. But who is it that Paul thanks? He doesn't thank the people. He doesn't thank himself, the church planter. Paul says he doesn't stop thanking God. God. And this is important. God is the source of all of our faith and all of the love, all the good things that we do at church. God is the source. And I'm sure when we think about Paul prayer, I'm sure every single one of us finds it hard to pray. I know I do. I fall short of my expectations and goals when it comes to prayer. Sometimes we forget to pray. Sometimes we don't really know what to say when we pray. And sometimes when we pray, it just feels like our heart really isn't in it. And so, you know, after 30 seconds of prayer, you're sort of like, I'm, I don't know, like I'm bored already. What else do I say? If you struggle with prayer, here's what you might need to hear. Deep, God-honoring, fulfilling prayer begins with thanksgiving. Deep, God-honoring and fulfilling prayer begins with thanksgiving. And we, and, and we can thank Him for external, outward, changing circumstances like weather, jobs, or family. But really deep, really fulfilling, really God-honoring prayer begins by really appreciating our relationship with God. What has God done to make me able to, to come to Him in prayer and call Him my God and my Father? really getting to grips with the spiritual blessings given to us in Jesus, that's where deep God-honoring and fulfilling prayer begins. The most fundamental aspect of prayer is humble gratitude in light of the glorious and massive grace of God. And that's what Paul has gone through in the first 15 verses. And even as he prays for the Ephesian church for their faith and love, he says, I'm going to attribute it to God. I'm going to thank God the way that he's grown you in faith and love. And and we can easily skip all of this, uh, uh, all of these big things and go straight into, uh, you know what, I need to pray more because I I I need to pray that I I can be a better person. I need to pray to God to ask him that I could read the Bible more. I I need to pray for this and that. We just sometimes need to slow down and zoom out. Look at the massive, big, things that God has done and is doing in Jesus and will do in Jesus. But with thanksgiving, Paul, as I said, is actually asking God for more. He's thanking God. He's asking God for more. And, this, and you know what this is like? This is like when Angelina and I feed our daughter Claudia. 
Claudia sits strapped in her little feeding chair contraption thingy, and um, she's just started on pureed foods. And uh, she, like, the other day, she had this Greek yogurt mixed with pureed cooked pear or something, whatever. And, um, and she just demolished it. She absolutely demolished it. She licked the plate clean, the bowl clean. She didn't actually, but... And she can't speak, obviously. But I can swear, after she finished the bowl, she looked at me and she said, Daddy, can I have some more? <laughs> and I was like, my child is a genius. Um, so what do I do? When my, when my child has finished her bowl of food and she looks at me, like she's got her little spoon and she's like, ah. what do I do? I'm a generous, loving dad. So I take the bowl and I go to Angelina and ask, what should I do? <laughs> and she tells me, give her some more. Okay, so I do. So as a generous parent, when your child recognizes something that is good, and, and they come to you asking for more, what do you do? As a parent, you want to, and you will, give them more. And that's exactly what Paul is doing here. He's asking that God would give more, and he's really asking also that Christians, that the Ephesian Christians would learn to come and to want God to give them more too. But more what? Next slide, 17 and 18. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know. And we're going to pause there. The key to understanding the purpose of Paul's prayer are, are these two verses. What is Paul praying for more of? He, Paul is asking God to give the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that Christians might get to know God better, that the eyes of their hearts may be enlightened. And this really is the goal of our Christian walk, that God would open our, uh, the eyes of our hearts to really know him better with each passing day. And Paul says that's a work of the spirit, the spirit of wisdom and revelation makes us wiser. The Spirit continues to reveal. He awakens us, not to something completely new, but to something that we already know, but we don't fully comprehend. It's like a window of your car that's misted over, and we turn on the AC, and it slowly clears up the windscreen, and we can see the scenery outside, or, or, or like you're waking up from a nap, and you're sort of just rubbing your blurry eyes, and, and your vision gets clearer and clearer. What use is it really having all the blessings of Christ, if we can't even appreciate it, if we're happy to be stuck seeing just a blurred vision of it, we don't appreciate what we have. See, God's Spirit opens the eyes of our hearts to know Him better, to see Him clearer, to be able to say, along with Paul, like the way he writes in Ephesians, praise be to God, to the God and Father of my Lord Jesus Christ. He's blessed me with every spiritual blessing and every day I can see it more and more. Uh, I, every day I can, I can feel and I can understand and I can appreciate the fact that He chose me before the creation of the world. Every day I, I'm just getting a, a stronger sense of what it means to, for me to be adopted into sonship. I, I can appreciate today a little more than yesterday as I see myself and I see the world around me that, that, Jesus, that He has redeemed me by the blood of Jesus, that He has made known to me the mystery of His will. He's committed to fulfilling His plans to bring everything under Christ and God has, is committed to making me a part of those plans. It, doesn't it make sense for us to go to God and say, God, please, Make this more and more real to me. So we need God's Spirit to help us say, you know, I, I don't care what the world thinks. I, I don't care what the world says uh, my life should be. I, I don't even care really at some level what my friends and family think. What I care about is the glory of God in Jesus shown to me. 
I want to feel God's good pleasure in my life. I want to love the riches of God's grace that have been lavished on me. I want to praise Him. I want to bless Him. That's what the Spirit does in us. So I encourage you, pray this for yourself constantly, but also remember, Paul is praying this for others. So pray this for others, for our church, for your life group, for your family, for your kids, constantly too. Okay. Now, with that in mind, there's at least three things that Paul is asking God to give a, a greater understanding of so that we might learn and know and see and appreciate Jesus more. Here are the three things. The first is hope. Verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. We have been called to be a people of hope. Yeah, every single person in the world longs for hope. Every single person is searching for something, whether it be in a relationship, whether it be in a job, whether it be in moving to a new country, whoops, whether it be when they go to visit their doctor. Uh, everyone is searching for something to give them confidence and comfort and care for them in their hopelessness, in the uncertainty of what their future holds. We all know that life is messed up and we all wish for something better, but everything that we could put our hope in to improve our position in the world, to give us some sense of security and safety, to help us feel like we're headed towards something better, everything that isn't Jesus is actually not real hope. Because hope, as the Bible puts it, is not a wish. Hope isn't wishing. We, we know when we say to people, I, I hope you have a good day, well, we don't know. We're, just, we're human. But hope is, real hope is not wishing that something might happen or something might work. Real hope, Christian hope, hope in Jesus is looking forward to something that has already been guaranteed. Christian hope is a hope that we have been called to by God. It's a hope based on the unchanging truth that Christians are people who are called by God to belong to Him, to be His holy people, called, as uh, Paul began this letter, by the will of God. Called to Jesus. Called to holiness called to freedom and peace, called to suffering and glory, called to a hope that puts us beyond the present to the glory which will one day be revealed. You and I are called to that hope every single day. Second, the riches of God's glorious inheritance uh, continuing on from, from verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Um, this reference to inheritance, I think, uh, is a little different from what we might be used to. Uh, we often think of inheritance as something God has given to us, and already in the book of Ephesians, Paul has mentioned that, verse 14, he's talked about how the Spirit is a deposit that guarantees our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. And so that's obviously very true, and we should keep that in mind. But there's a good argument that Paul here, in this verse, is actually speaking about not our inheritance, but God's inheritance, the riches of God's own glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now, why should we care that there's a difference? What does that mean? It means this, that Paul might be asking here for God to help Christians know that we are God's own glorious inheritance. We are God's possession. Why does that matter? Because 
This is an encouragement for us to appreciate the value that God has placed on you as part of his people united to Jesus. Remember you are God's in Jesus. Remember you belong to God in Jesus. Remember you are God's possession in Jesus, the people of his covenant. No matter what your circumstance, whether you're persecuted, whether you're oppressed, whether you're living in Ephesus, surrounded by all of these temple worship, whether you're deprived, whether you're depressed, not only have you been given an inheritance by God, uh, all spiritual blessings in Christ, but also understand that you are God's inheritance. You are God's own possession. He is jealous over those he loves. He's jealous over you. He will not leave you, and he will not forget you. Third, God's incomparably great power. See, Paul prays that we would know and see with the eyes of our heart the incomparably great power of God that works in and for and through us. I'm going to read the, the last 18, verses 18 to 23. I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, every name that is invoked, invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. See, God's power is incomparably great. God's power is unfathomably mighty. And how do we know? Paul says we know because God has publicly demonstrated his power in Jesus. See, this is the thing about believing in Jesus. This is the thing about Christianity and the Christian faith. The call to have assurance in God's power, that God's power means something and it is mighty, is not a call to blind faith. The Christian call to believe in Jesus is actually a call to believe in a historical event. It's not a theory. It's not a story. It's a historical event. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that if the resurrection didn't happen, Christianity is not only false, but Christians are pathetic, stupid people. What other religion or worldview bases their whole validity on one single historical event? What religion is crazy enough to say, hey, if this didn't happen, yeah, we'll admit this is all a lie. This is all a big waste of time if this didn't happen. Either whoever invented Christianity is out of touch with reality, thinking millions or even billions of people uh, across history would be stupid enough to believe that someone could rise again from the dead and then go and challenge everyone in their religious book to go and disprove it, or it really happened. And if it happened, Paul says the same power that, ra that, God, that, that, that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power of God over death, and over evil, over sickness, in fact, over every conceivable rule and authority and power and dominion, over every name, past, present, and future, that same power is God's great power that is acting in and for and towards and through us who believe. God has placed Jesus over everything, and the amazing, amazing part of this is that the focal point of Christ's rule in the world is actually the church. God placed all things under his feet. He appointed Jesus to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. See, this is incredible. 
Paul is saying something incredible about the church, and therefore Paul is saying something incredible about you and me as individuals and as Kingsway. The one who is above all names and authorities and powers, the one who fills the universe with his glory, the one who, who at his feet every knee will bow, his fullness, his glory is displayed and represented and showcased and lived out in and through his body, the church. Christ fills the universe with his glory by showing the universe what he has done for his body and his bride. How he chose her. How he destined her for eternity with him. How he, how he came to her. How he suffered for her, how he died for her, how he rose again for her in power, how he reigns for her at the right hand of God, how he called her and justified her, how he sanctifies her, how he gives his spirit to reveal and to give wisdom, how he keeps her and grows her and matures her, satisfies her and promises to glorify her. See, you and I are making up the fullness of the glory of Jesus in the world. That's, that's epic. If you're struggling uh, with sin, if you're wondering if there's a power out there that's strong enough to give you victory in the battle, if you're, if you're wondering if there's a hope out there that's trustworthy enough to save you in your hopelessness, if you're wondering if there's a, a place to belong that's big enough to handle all your baggage and imperfections, if you're wondering if there is a person who could love you truly as you are and yet n not leave you uh, in your brokenness, then remember that Jesus is above every power and authority and name, and he is pleased for the fullness of his glory to dwell and be displayed in the church with his people, with you. The power of God that was at work in Jesus is at work within you and me, and he will fill us up to the fullness of of Jesus. He will grow us. He will mature us. He will give us wisdom and understanding that we might know him better. So take courage, give thanks as Paul does, and ask God for more. Let's pray. Lord, we, we know you're massive, and the, the things that you have done for us in Jesus are so big. Uh, sometimes we just don't really think about it and appreciate it. Help us, Lord, to give you thanks every moment of our lives that we might get to know you better, that, that the, the, the just absolute um, awesomeness of what you've done for us in the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ would be made a tiny bit more real to us every single day. Help us to come to you as Paul does, praying for ourselves and praying for our brothers and sisters that we might get to know you better by your Spirit, that we might get to understand and see and, and, and appreciate the hope of our calling, the glorious inheritance that we have and that we are, and also the great power that works in and through and within us. Lord, we look forward to experiencing that more and more. We ask this in the name of your risen Son, Jesus. Amen. Do we have time to do the song?